every day we don't deploy at a very large scale to create up to half a degree minimum Celsius of cooling is resulting in needless extinctions and deaths and basically preventable disasters around the world. This doesn't fix everything, but this can fix temperature. Three, two, one. Humanity is responsible for global warming. But what if we could cool the planet back down as well? Will a technological fix for the climate save us? Do we see the outlines of an emerging billion dollar industry? Or is it just false hope? This is Backlight. Welcome to the future of planet coolers. Somewhere in the hills of Silicon Valley, a camper appears once a month. Two DIY enthusiasts are working on the solar radiation management. Okay, ready? Yeah. That's why they keep lugging around large cylinders with sulfur dioxide. We're just tightening it up a little bit, so making sure that uh, there's no leaks. They claim they're cooling down the planet. And because it also creates beautiful sunsets, they decided to call their startup Make Sunsets. Today, these two entrepreneurs tell their story on national radio. Yeah, you can barely hear it, but here. <laughs> According to Luke and Andrew, it's easy to cool down the planet and everyone can do it. You fill a weather balloon, release it, and when it rises to 10 kilometers, it explodes in the stratosphere. Then the balloon falls down, but the sulfur dioxide stays there. And that sulfur dioxide reflects the sunlight, and as a result, less radiation reaches Earth. And voila, a cooler planet is within reach. Yeah, you can kind of smell it a little bit right now. But it just smells like rotten eggs. Yeah. Yeah. Is it leaking? Uh, yeah, it's a little bit permeable, so you'll smell a little bit of it, but it's not too bad. We're in open air, and yeah. It's a very small amount. <coughs> I'm definitely smelling it. Glad I have yeah. my mask on. <coughs> you don't want to breathe no. lots of it frequently. You've gotten used to the smell, probably. Not really. Just don't take big whiffs of air, I guess, when you're close <laughs> to the source. Just don't breathe. <laughs> this idea was not plucked from thin air. In the 1970s, it was still a wild and futuristic plan. But it's been the subject of serious research in recent years. Technically, it is feasible with a fleet of especially designed aeroplanes. A group of students is presented with a future scenario, according to some climate scientists, not entirely unrealistic. I want to take you to the year 2045, and you are the Dutch foreign minister. Research has recently shown that the climate is much more sensitive to CO2 than we thought, so doubling CO2 would lead to 5 Kelvin of warming. And right now this year, a huge heat wave hits northern India with many thousands of deaths. Now, India and Bangladesh together announced the Operation Solar Dimming, so they want to reflect some sunlight to cool the Earth. How will you, as a foreign minister, react to that? Well, I see you look a bit in a confused way, and I understand maybe the first thing you want to do is to discuss with your science advisor. What are they talking about? How does solar radiation management even work? Does it actually help against climate change? Is it dangerous for us here in the Netherlands? Can they do it? Is it feasible? The inspiratie tot de solar radiation management komt eigenlijk vooral van grote vulkaanuitbarstingen. Ik heb hier een plaatje dat is genomen na de uitbarsting van de Pinatubo vulkaan in 1991. En grote explosieve vulkaanuitbarstingen die stoten zwaveldioxide uit, SO2. En dan met zoveel kracht dat het in de stratosfeer komt. De stratosfeer is de atmosfeer boven zeg maar 15, 20 kilometers. En je ziet het hier ook in dat plaatje. Dus hier aan de onderkant heb je het gewone weer gebeuren. En daarboven heb je twee zwarte lagen. En dat zijn dus die lagen van, van het sulfaat aerosol dat door die pinatubo uitbarsting is ontstaan. En net zoals normale wolken kunnen ook deze wolken inkomend zonlicht weer terugkaatsen. En daardoor de aarde een beetje afkoelen. En nou ja, het idee is een beetje als pinatubo dat kan, kunnen wij dat misschien ook. 
This might actually be a punctured balloon, no? You think so? That would be a first. Why do you think it might be punctured? It smells a little more than it normally would. Yeah. We'll give it another minute and see. Okay. Dit wordt al gedaan, hè? Nee, dit wordt niet gedaan. In uh, Silicon Valley zijn er twee. Uh... Oh, die groep. Oh, er is een kleine groep die beweert dat ze dat aan het proberen zijn. Ze gaan nooit en nimmer hoeveelheden bereiken die ook maar iets doen met het klimaat. En eerlijk gezegd, ik maak me best wel boos over die groep. Als we dat ooit willen doen als mensheid, dan hoop ik echt, het is moeilijk, maar ik hoop ten zeerste dat dat dan um, gebeurt als een internationaal besluit waar mensen ook inspraak aan hebben. Dus dat die groep gewoon beweert dat ze dat alvast even gaan doen, vind ik echt zorgelijk. But it is geoengineering. Oh ja. Yeah. And how did you learn how to make sulfur dioxide? Oh, it's super simple. Just burn, burn the SO2 in the presence of oxygen. Googled um, how to make SO2. Yeah. It's very, very straightforward. So you looked up a YouTube video or something? Literally. Yeah. Yeah. Make Sunsets sells self-devised cooling credits. Every dollar we donate to them relieves us of our feelings of guilt for every ton of CO2 we emit. What are you looking for? Just opening the window. Oh. If it's bothering someone, we have masks as well, like actual acid ones. And what do you buy for 10 bucks? Uh, for 10 bucks, you get 10 cooling credits per month fulfilled for you. And what does it mean? Like, how much? Uh, so for 10 cooling credits, it offsets the one we affect of 10 tons of CO2 for you. Our flight was six tons. There you go. So that'd be six bucks. Cheap. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's, that's why we're exploring this, like, to even start. It's because it's so inexpensive. It's scalable and it's temporary. Does that mean you want to grow bigger? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Th right now, this is these one-offs, but that's why we invited Tom as well, because you know, he, he works with a lot of startups, and hopefully we can create some kind of partnership to scale up to corporations and eventually governments as well. Luckily, there is such a job as climate ethicist someone who thinks about the ethics of deploying technologies that can drastically change the climate. What in Silicon Valley happens is what I worry Enerzijds omdat wij de lange termijn gevolgen nog, uh, nog niet kennen. En ik zou veel liever uh, gecontroleerde experimenten doen. Gepubliceerd in wetenschappelijke bladen, besproken door wetenschappers enzovoort enzovoort. Dan dat je zomaar uh, van jezelf uh, deeltjes de lucht inspuit. Want wat zijn de risico's eigenlijk van, van zwaveldioxide in de stratosfeer? Een mogelijk risico zou kunnen zijn dat de weerpatronen veranderen. Een uh, ander risico zou kunnen zijn dat, uh, dat de ozonlaag uh, aangetast wordt. De risico's zijn niet klein. De risico's die uit de modellen blijken zijn, zijn heel groot. En er zijn voornamelijk heel veel open vragen die, die beantwoord moeten worden. Het is uh, misschien een ludieke actie, uh, maar als je kijkt ook naar de plannen van het bedrijf dat daarmee bezig is en het hele businessplan dat daaromheen ontwikkeld is, is het meer dan alleen maar een ludieke actie om aandacht te vragen voor de zaak. Uh, ze geloven erin dat, uh, dat hier een business in zit voor de komende jaren. En dat is, uh, dat is gevaarlijk, want uh, de suggestie wordt gewerkt dat, dat je de aarde kunt afkoelen. We moeten nog heel veel leren over deze methodes. De methodes die op dit moment niet wenselijk zijn en wat mij betreft nooit als wenselijk moeten worden beschouwd, tenzij we ze heel hard nodig hebben. Dat vergt onderzoek en dit soort initiatieven staan onderzoek in de weg. Solar radiation management can also be done with both feet on the ground. Ice also reflects sunlight. 90% of the radiation that reaches our polar caps gets reflected. For the time being, that is. Ik vond het eigenlijk uh, ongelooflijk om te bedenken dat dat Noordpoolijs gewoon aan het verdwijnen is. In de jaren 30 of jaren 40 is er gewoon een eerste ijsvrije zomer. Um, en toen dacht ik, kan je niet op een of andere manier dat ijs in stand houden? Elke winter ligt er natuurlijk genoeg ijs, maar als je dat water van onder het ijs op het ijs uh, pompt, uh, aan de bovenkant is het dan min 30 en dan versnel je eigenlijk het vriesproces, waardoor je dikker ijs creëert, 
uh, zodat je in de zomer meer uh, ijs overhoudt en dus die reflecterende werking van dat ijs uh, ook beter in stand houdt. The solution is quite simple, according to Fonger and his colleagues. You drill a hole, put a pipe in it, and start pumping. And because we're losing 100,000 square kilometers of ice every year, they also want to spray 100,000 square kilometers, year after year. 100,000 vierkante kilometer, hoe, hoe groot zou dat ongeveer zijn? Nou, dat, is, dat is eigenlijk niet zo groot. Dat is eigenlijk een, een gebiedje, uh, nou, zo ongeveer zo groot als zo'n eilandje. Dus dat valt gewoon. Eilandje, uh, dat is wel twee keer Nederland. Dus uh, dat is, uh, ja, het zijn enorme afstanden daar. Uh. En bij het opschalen zou je veel grotere pompen gebruiken? Nou, wij denken dat we met zo'n 100 tot 1000 grote uh, ja, offshore sites um, um, uh, dit, uh, dit zouden moeten kunnen doen. Uh, in Nederland hebben we natuurlijk ook een offshore industrie die gewend is um, ja, groot, grote projecten uh, te doen. Dingen zoals een uh, palmeilanden opspuiten voor de kust van uh, Dubai. Dus ik denk dat uiteindelijk als... als we kunnen aantonen dat dit echt een uh, positief effect heeft. Dat we het ook zouden moeten kunnen organiseren om dit, uh, ja, die operatie uh, neer te zetten. Vind je het in de loop der tijd een steeds minder gestoord idee? Ik denk dat het, uh, dat het uh, stap voor stap gaat. Dus eerst was het een uh, wild idee. Toen bleek er uh, uh, toch al uh, wetenschappers naar gekeken te hebben. Toen bleek eigenlijk de technologie al uh, voorhanden. Dus zo stap voor stap denk je eigenlijk is het zo gek nog niet. Eigenlijk hebben we ook uh, dit initiatief, uh, ja, heb ik besloten we er fulltime aan... Uh, aan te wijden, omdat ik ook dacht van ja, als je dit uh, in uh, academisch onderzoekfase uh, laat hangen, dan, uh, nou ja, dan heb je over vijf jaar bij wijze van spreken een, uh, een heel mooi promotieonderzoek. Um, maar dan is het ijs alweer een stuk uh, verder weg. Dus uh, het is echt mijn overtuiging dat je hier ook gewoon praktisch mee, mee aan de slag uh, moet. Ander wild idee, maar ik denk dat het een idee is dat uh, de moeite van dat onderzoeken waard is. Het gunstige effect dat je daarmee realiseert is inderdaad heel groot. Je moet ook wel de afweging maken van wat voor risico's lopen we dan. En kennen we dat voldoende om het te kunnen opschalen? En bij sommige technieken moet je je afvragen of je het überhaupt moet gaan overwegen. Want de risico's kennen we nog onvoldoende. En je moet wel gaan experimenteren. En bij het experimenteren kunnen we leren. En op basis daarvan beslissen welke technologieën willen we verder ontwikkelen. En welke moeten we misschien helemaal niet overwegen. All across the globe, scientists, inventors and entrepreneurs are working on the most wide-ranging ideas. One idea to preserve glaciers was to pack them. But the glaciers were melting faster than expected and collapsed with canvas and all. As with all ideas, it always comes down to whether they're feasible, scalable and affordable. The latest glacier plan is to cover them with snow from gigantic sprinkler installations. At sea, cannons are used to nebulize seawater to create clouds that can, and you probably guessed it, reflect sunlight. There is another method to cool Earth. You can remove CO2 from the atmosphere. There are all sorts of wild experiments and research going on into that too. Microalgae absorb CO2, which is taken from the water and buried under meters of sand in the desert of Morocco. CO2 is captured from the air with gigantic hoovers and then put back where it came from, deep underground. A special kind of mineral sand gets spread out. It's made of olivine, a type of rock with a unique characteristic. It can create a chemical bond with CO2. And it could be even crazier. There's a company that wants to make fake meat from captured CO2. All these technologies still have to be proven. But wild ideas are always worth researching, aren't they? There are several scenarios 
um, described in the recent IPCC reports. So you see here the red line is a very pessimistic scenario, the worst case scenario of a lot of CO2 emissions. So basically CO2 emissions per year will more than double um, compared to what they are now. And the blue line here is the most optimistic scenario um, there it is assumed that from 2055 onwards we will be able to take out more CO2 from the atmosphere than we are currently putting in. Oh yeah, this sort of, I find this sort of graphic very eng. Eng. You mean that it's a graphic or from that the inhoud eng is? The inhoud. Want I think that always it will always be the bovenste. Yeah, we are now not helemaal op dit terrein. Dus oh no. Nee. Dit, dit wordt wel gezien als worst case scenario, maar we, we lijken nu eerder op zoiets af te steven. Hè? Dus misschien tussen de gele en de rode in of zo. Baart dit je zorgen? Dit soort, uh, of wat, hoe kijk jij naar dit soort grafiekjes? Ja, nou dat baart me grote zorgen, want er is een significante kans aanwezig dat zelfs als we ons best doen, dat er dan echt nare dingen gaan gebeuren. Kijk, hier zit de aanname in dat we negatieve emissies kunnen doen. Dus dat we vanaf 2055 meer CO2 uit de lucht kunnen halen dan dat we nu daarin aan stoppen zijn. Maar we weten nog helemaal niet zo goed hoe we dat moeten bereiken. Er zijn veel ideeën wat je zou kunnen doen. Maar bij alle is de vraag, kan je die genoeg opschalen? Dus dat, het, dat je genoeg CO2 per jaar uit de lucht kan halen. En kunnen we snel genoeg opschalen, dat die snel genoeg gaan werken? En zolang we dit niet weten, weten we dus niet of we die negatieve emissies kunnen gaan halen. Ideas galore. But with so much CO2 in the air, we'll need a tremendously large industry to extract it again. Which idea is scalable enough to get the job done? This is Olivine Sand. Tom Green, the founder of a startup in San Francisco, is modest about it. This wasn't my idea. This was the Earth's idea. Olivine has been naturally removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere literally for billions of years. We take this out of the ground and then we grind it into sand. We take that sand and we place it in the seawater just next to a coastline. And the sand gradually dissolves in the seawater. As it dissolves, it adds something called alkalinity to the seawater, so making the seawater less acidic. And that causes the ocean to do what it does best, actually, which is to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it permanently in the seawater itself. By spreading the green CO2 guzzling mineral olivine on beaches, they want to stop the acidification of the oceans. And if we're protecting our shores from a rising sea level anyway, we might as well do that with olivine sand. A win-win scenario. But how much olivine sand do we need and where do we get it from? Olivine is actually often found as a waste product from different kinds of mining operations. It's one of the most abundant minerals on the planet. Millions of tons of olivine sitting around as, as waste. Extracting rocks, grinding them, transporting them. These are parts of the supply chain that, as humans, we have a lot of experience in extracting rocks and moving them around the world. This is something we know how to do well, and this is something uh, which benefits from very large economies of scale. That's one of the reasons we chose this. At maximum scale, uh, we believe that we will be able to remove a ton of CO2 from the atmosphere for just $21 per ton. The carbon removal market is currently exploding. We're seeing that market growing by almost 10 times this year. There are quite a few companies that have a target to achieve net zero by 2030 and that are buying more and more carbon removal every year in order to get to that point where by 2030 they're having no net negative impact on the atmosphere. The most well-known way to compensate for CO2 is planting new trees. 
You could say that planting trees is a very straightforward solution for our climate problem. But some researchers say that there's not enough space for that many trees. So they invented enormous vacuum cleaners to capture CO2. Nice and compact. I'm, I'm really excited about the pace of action on climate. And for years, uh, uh, us academics and some policy people would talk about climate, but basically nothing would happen. I used to give talks saying it's a phony war. People talk about climate, but if you came down as an alien and looked around the earth, you wouldn't see any real action. That's not true anymore. Climate researcher and entrepreneur David Keith has set up such a vacuum cleaner system. Direct air capture is uh, just an industrial process that takes in atmospheric air, uh, makes a pure CO2 stream. This technology is called direct air capture. It involves large extractors that filter the outside air. The filter must be heated to remove any CO2 the system captures. An enormous amount of energy is needed to heat the filters. So these factories are preferably in locations with an abundance of clean energy, like Iceland. Even if emissions were eliminated today, the climate risk basically persists forever. And so carbon removal can do that. And direct air capture is one of many methods of carbon removal. Placing large vacuum cleaners, which use a great deal of energy to remove small particles in remote areas, isn't that a bit cumbersome? You could also capture CO2 closer to the source, directly next to the polluting industry. This is what is about to happen at companies in the port of Rotterdam. But where do you put the CO2 then? So, <laughs> is normal for normal vlakte. We come dus eigenlijk uit het oosten met all our met the CO2 from the oosten. En hier op deze locatie gaan we de CO2 uh, onder de Harde Zeemier heen, onder de Maaskul, waar nu die, uh, waar nu die schepen varen, richting het platform transporteren. Sorry. Er spreekt voor hoeveel CO2? We spreken van uh, 37 megaton aan CO2 totaal, uh, waar we ongeveer zo'n 15 jaar over doen. Dus 2,5 megaton per jaar. Zullen we hier onderdoor transporteren richting het, uh, richting het gasveld? Kijk hier op het kaartje, de display. Dat zie je globale trek, maar je ziet ook de zeekaart en dat is wel leuk hiervan. Hier is een uh, productieplatform, een gasproductieplatform. Hieronder zitten de velden eigenlijk, de gasvelden. En uh, daar wordt het CO2 in geïnjecteerd. Welke bedrijven zijn dat die, uh, waar dat wordt afgevangen? Ja, hier, hier in het begin zijn een aantal uh, bedrijven in de botlek. We hebben vier uh, klanten nu. Exxon, Shell, Air Liquide and Air Products. Until recently, it was commonplace to dump your CO2 in the atmosphere. But emissions are increasingly taxed, so companies are looking for ways to reduce those costs. The carbon catcher and storage technology offers companies a location for their CO2. They're putting it back where it once came from, deep underground. But does this work? En dus die CO2, die gaat ze allemaal die oude gasvelden in, kan het niet lekken. Nee. Australia set up Gorgon, a project that cost three billion dollars and was discontinued after five years. It had only stored a third of the promised CO2 underground. According to a 2020 study, 100 of the 149 carbon capture and storage projects around the globe have been suspended indefinitely. Nou, Gorgon, ik kan niet spreken voor alle projecten, maar het klopt. Bij Gorgon zijn er een aantal risico's opgetreden. Gelukkig kunnen we leren daarvan. En we hebben ze gekwantificeerd en we gaan er ook zeker met die risico's zijn we zeker aan de slag gaan. Ja, ja. Dus het zou een techniek moeten zijn die steeds beter wordt. Klopt. Klopt, ja. Je beweren wel met de grote stelligheid dat er dat er zoveel CO2 wordt opgeslagen. Ja. Maar er kan, er kan wat misgaan. Um, nee, ik denk niet. Ik denk dat we, nee, ik denk dat we op, dit, op dit moment 
Uh, zoals we er nu uh, voor staan en uh, met de onderzoeken die we gedaan hebben, uh, zien we dat het een, een goed uh, te injecteren put is. We hebben heel veel ervaring met de put, want we hebben natuurlijk al 30 jaar uh, gas, uh, um, uh, gasproductie is daar geweest. En als het gasveld vol is? Als het gasveld vol is over 15 jaar, sluiten we hem af. Hoe? Uh, zetten we beton in. Meters, beton. En dan niet enkele meters, maar honderden meters beton. En daarmee sluit hem af. Oké. Okay. Ja. Pot dicht. Pot dicht, ja. En dan hopen dat het erin blijft. En dan weten dat het erin blijft. <laughs> Making this show took tons of emissions. We store millions of tons in former gas fields. And we emit dozens of gigatons on a global scale. The amount of tons is dazzling and almost incomprehensible. On a planetary scale, uh, here's the scale of the problem. So we are humans. We're causing the emissions of about 40 gigatons, so 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every single year. That's too much. We've been doing that for many years. There's approximately a trillion tons of excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere already sitting there. So we need to do two things. We need to reduce emissions and we need to bring them all the way to zero by about the middle of the century. And we also need to take care of the fact that there's just too much carbon dioxide already sitting in the atmosphere. And that's where carbon dioxide removal comes in. We're going to need somewhere between five and 10 billion tons per year of carbon dioxide removal. So this is a very large scale problem and we're going to need multiple solutions and multiple solutions that can scale. When we just look at direct air capture systems, how many of that do we need? This square represents the amount of emission an installation can currently capture. These squares represent the amount of emissions the installations that we are now going to build should be able to process. By 2030, we're going to need many more of these installations, as many of these squares. Then we'll have to build about 30 more of these things every year until 2050. All of this is good for capturing one gigaton of CO2. To put this in perspective, we emit no less than 40 gigatons of CO2 per year. This is in addition to the 1,000 gigatons of excess CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. Is that veel? That is heel veel, yeah. Wie zou er moeten kunnen beslissen over dit soort technieken? Wie over deze technieken beslissen die over de hele aarde gaan, dat is de, de million dollar question van, uh, van, van deze toepassingen. Uiteindelijk uh, ben je met z'n allen, alle landen verantwoordelijk voor de aarde en de beslissingen daarover. Maar we weten hoe de machtsstructuren werken of hoe de machtsstructuren eigenlijk wel scheve besluitvorming kunnen veroorzaken. En wat mij betreft nog grotere zorg is dat het helemaal uit handen van de overheden gaat en dat uh, private partijen zich ermee gaan bemoeien. Uh, maar dan, dan heb je er helemaal geen controle meer over. It's going to take a while before we can all live a sustainable and circular life. The way things are looking now, it seems that we'll have to rely on oil companies for the time being. But those oil companies have to start compensating now. And that is why they've devised a new plan. They're investing in CO2 capture technologies. So you were the founder of, uh, of the company Carbon Engineering? Yep. But uh, I understood that it's sold to uh, an oil company, yep. uh, petroleum, yep. uh, Occidental Petroleum. Yep. Aren't you afraid that they could use this technique to prolong their way of... I don't think it's their choice whether or not hydrocarbons is prolonged. That's a policy choice. It's our choice. It's a citizen's choice. So in the end, oil companies at some level do what the political environment tells them to do. So from my perspective, uh, I, I think so. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we're basically at zero. To, I know, so I'll try this, but it's a, to me an entirely different topic that's different from my academic world. So 
The obvious worry is that somehow it magically preserves the core oil business. I don't think it does, because in a world where there's strong enough climate policy to make air capture happen, which is hundreds of dollars a ton CO2, in that world, the oil business is in serious trouble and oil production is going down. But the CEO of Occidental Petroleum sees things differently. After purchasing the direct air capture company, they claim they can keep pumping oil for another 60, 70, or maybe even 80 years. A big hurrah for business as usual. Will we ever get rid of oil, coal and gas? Or is our economy keeping us in a stranglehold? Capitalism is, is the main economic system in society and has been a uh, is the system that we've had while we have created this problem for ourselves. I don't foresee that fundamental economic system changing anytime soon. And I do see that the, uh, the forces of capitalism, the mechanisms of capitalism, if co-opted correctly, and if applied to carbon removal, can mobilize the world and mobilize our company and many other companies around the world to deliver carbon dioxide removal at the kind of scale we need it. They're so much fun. Do you want to let it go? Uh, I'll let you do it. Three, two, one. Eleven oh five. Eleven oh five. Okay. Technology got us into this problem, and technology will get us to muddle through it as it always has. Yeah. Aren't you scared that you would accidentally cause any ecological disaster? I were the world is doing quite a good job of intentionally causing an ecological disaster with our carbon-based geoengineering. What we're doing stays up for two years. It's the same thing that volcanoes output, and we have millennia of a natural record of what it does. So people are scared of new things until they become a bit more normalized, and this is you know somewhere in that process of being normalized. Sunscreen for Earth is is the is the best way to describe it. Just put some on your, on your skin and you don't get skin cancer. And so location and quantity matters. You know, obviously you don't drink the sunscreen. You just apply it as used. Is it a problem that investors wonder if they can make money with these technologies? In the north of Sweden, a scientific test with weather balloons was supposed to take place. The Sami, the last indigenous people in the EU and the inhabitants of that region, protested when they heard about it. And the scientist that was about to conduct this test is a familiar face. Well, actually, it wasn't clear we were going to use sulfur dioxide, and the thing in, in Sweden was actually just the flight of a... a, a we weren't re releasing anything was the plan. The, way that this has been discussed is as if we were somehow going to test geoengineering at large scale and find out whether it worked. And that just isn't whatever we were going to do. The Sami are at the front line of climate change. There is little time left to defend their way of life. But they do not want to defend it with sulfur dioxide. That test in itself would not have caused uh, a lot of impacts then and there. But we uh, strongly oppose the development of the solar geoengineering technology. We do not see this path as being uh, a path of our chosen future. So we wanted to very clearly state that we do not approve of this technology being legitimized and, and, and developed in SAPMI. It's not focusing on the core issues of climate change. It doesn't make us um, release less CO2. What it does is for us to uh, handle the consequences of climate change, more or less. I think a headline in The Guardian saying how Bill Gates wanted to block out the sun. So you think it was a bit blown up in the media? Oh, it was enormously blown up in the media. There were ideas that this was like a next step to deployment where in fact the amount of material that we were talking about releasing, even in, we weren't actually gonna release anything in that flight in Sweden, but the amount that would be released in a Scopex experiment is about a, a kilogram of material. 
and that's less than a conventional airplane like you flew on, uh, uh, releases in a single minute of flight. We have been advocating for climate action for a really long time, and we know that it's been really hard. It is still really hard to get uh, big corporations and states and all uh, actors with, uh, on the key positions in the world to do the right thing. If then there is a notion of a plan B, that we might have a quick fix, we might not need to change after all. And we know that we have a really, really small window now to reach the climate targets. So what if then some of these states, big corporations that we know have huge impact, uh, just sit down a bit and say that, well, let's just wait a bit longer. Maybe we don't have to. That might be the one thing that actually makes us not reach the, the climate uh, targets. I think what's happened is these experiments have kind of become a proxy for the larger fight about whether we should take this technology seriously at all. What do you think about that? Um, I think that's a legitimate point of view, but I don't think it's a convincing or just point of view. Which is something we should discuss. Well, absolutely. Which is something that people should actively discuss. That's the healthy discussion is, ought we to take this seriously? How should we govern it? Should there be a research program? What it should look like? That's the right discussion. So the climate is changing faster in the Arctic than anywhere else. Yeah. Are you opposed to any kind of tech fix? We need technology. We need research. That's uh, because we can't go back. We need to find a more sustainable solution for the future. And that means that we need all our good researchers, uh, all the technology that can help us in that direction. But we need to focus on the core, uh, what we are using technology and research for. We cannot forget also that we have traditional uh, knowledge and we have the indigenous knowledge all around the world that still have in their cultures and in these knowledge systems embedded the circular economy and the sustainable way of life. So in my view we should uh, combine the science uh, with the indigenous knowledge and that for me would be the best available knowledge. Are you frustrated about that we're having the wrong discussions? Yeah, of course. I think it would be better if people talked more clearly about the environmental and social risks of, of, of these technologies against not doing them, and more kind of realistically about how government decisions might get made. Should we do research or not? Who benefits from all these technologies? According to Jeroen Oman, a colleague of Claudia's, we should be more wary. All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, the debate that Claudia and I are going to have about climate engineering. What we really want to show you in the course is that every path forward, even technological ones, are really controversial. Do we think it is undesirable? Do we think it is unreliable? And do we think it is ungovernable? That is the debate that we're going to be having in the next 10, 15, 20 years, whether we like it or not. This is why I decided to write, together with a lot of other colleagues, a call for a non-use agreement on solar geoengineering. SRM will inevitably be used, and climate engineering at large, so all of these technologies will inevitably be used as a tool of climate denial and delay. There, there is no way that that is not going to happen. I, I will die on that hill. That is absolutely going to happen, and it's already happened. And it will be used to suggest implicitly that if we just go here, we can just keep doing what we're doing. Well, I say the genie is already out of the bottle. The thought is already out there. So in my view, there is already a considerable chance that in a few years or decades, a desperate government thinks that SRM is necessary. If we come to the situation, we should better have done our homework before someone is desperate enough to try it anyway. Een verantwoord solar radiation management scenario bestaat dat? Wat je niet moet doen is CO2 blijven uitstoten en dan hopen dat je het maar met SRM, met, met solar radiation management, gaat redden. Want 
We weten niet eens of je een zo sterke afkoeling kan halen en wat dan die bijwerkingen zouden zijn. En dan zit je met deze twee scenario's. Dus dit is het zogenaamde peak shaving scenario. Je schaaft zeg maar de verwarmingspiek eraf. Dus je probeert toch al je best te doen om minder CO2 uit te doten en uiteindelijk CO2 ook uit de lucht te halen. Maar je, je vreest toch dat het ondertussen een tijdje te warm wordt. En dan ga je dus tijdelijk, dus enkele decennia, en met behulp van solar radiation management de temperatuur op een bepaald pijl houden, bijvoorbeeld anderhalve graden. Als je het langzaam opbouwt, dan kan je dus beginnen met een kleine dosis. Kijken hoe dat bevalt, zeg maar, of het effect ongeveer is wat je verwacht. Als je merkt, oeh, het werkt toch sterker dan ik had vermoed, dan weet je dat je wat minder moet doen, of andersom. Dus dan kan je langzaam aan de zaak goed blijven monitoren terwijl je het aan het opschalen bent. Right, so my first proposition is that if we are serious about limiting climate change to 1.5 degree or thereabout, we have no choice but to at least seriously consider SRM. Please vote now. Hold up your color. Okay, there we go. Very interesting. I, I seem to have some work there. But mostly you agree with Claudia. 60-70% of the room seems to agree here with Claudia. Een ander mogelijk scenario wat wel eens geopperd wordt is we willen eigenlijk geen uh, solar radiation management doen. Uh, dus we houden het alleen um, achter de hand voor het geval dat er iets dreigt mis te gaan. Dus ook hier, we gaan CO2 terugdringen. Maar als we dan toch merken dat dat niet genoeg is, dan gaan we snel op het knopje drukken en um, solar radiation management aanzetten. Alleen het risico is, hoe weet je dan dat het nu tijd is om op het knopje te drukken? Of heb je misschien al irreversibel iets kapot gemaakt door te lang te wachten? Dus dat is een beetje wat wij ook aan het onderzoeken zijn. Not saying we shouldn't do any research at all. What I'm saying is we should be very careful to think about what kind of research that we're doing. Because it's a misconception to think that this research is apolitical. That we can just do this and that it doesn't have an effect in the real world. Als er geen klimaatverandering was en iemand zou zeggen, nou, zullen we een beetje aan klimaat sleutelen door zwavelzuur in de stratosfeer te blazen, zou ik zeggen, kom op, je bent gek. You moet, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Maar we zitten al met een enorm probleem, dus de vraag is niet, is SRM helemaal vrij van risico's? Dat is het niet, maar de vraag is, zijn de risico's van SRM erger of minder erg dan de risico van klimaatverandering? En dat moet je dus tegen elkaar afwegen. Hoe eerder we dat onderzoeken, hoe groter, denk ik, de kans dat als we het doen, dat we dat niet op de domste manier doen. I'm also quite a naturalist, so I find everything that we do against nature What is, is against in some extent wrong. What is against nature? It is, if, it's, if it's safe to green that ice cap, is it against nature or for nature? It is doing something into I Hard to answer. But I don't think you should fight fire with fire, kind of, if you want to see it like that. One of the things that I found is that you have a lot of people that fall on sort of different ends of the spectrum, where you have the technological fallacy and the naturalistic fallacy. Everything, technology, is good because it's technology, so it must be better. Anything natural is better because it's natural. And that often, then when, when people challenge you on it, leads to a situation where it's very hard to actually explain, well, what is the precise point here? Should we not be careful to be too dead set on technology? What if the best way to restore nature is nature itself? Should we not spend all of those billions of dollars on that? So far, nature has proven to be the only working solution that can capture CO2, and it does this very efficiently as well. For instance, trees. If we were to plant an area the size of the United States with trees right away, we could capture 205 gigatons of CO2 in the coming decades. That is something techno-fixers can only dream about. Forests, mangroves, wetlands, but also the oceans are the most obvious candidates to capture CO2. But we're destroying them at the moment. That's why Emily and Thomas want to start restoring a part of the North Sea. The nature does it all heel lang, heel goed zelf, zonder onze hulp. Uh, maar uh, nu heeft ze onze hulp nodig om, uh, om dat goed te kunnen blijven doen. Uh, we hebben zo lang zoveel natuur kapot gemaakt uh, dat we daarmee ook onze eigen, onze eigen leefgebieden kapot hebben gemaakt. Die hele Noordzee samen is een giga klimaatbuffer. Alleen, als je wil dat die klimaatbufferende werking er is, blijft en dat die wordt vergroot, 
Dan moet je dus gaan kijken van hoe gaan we die zeebodem beschermen en herstellen. Het neerslaan van koolstof in de bodem, dat kan de zee heel erg goed. En dat doet de zee al heel erg goed voor ons. Die vangt al uh, heel veel voor ons op. Maar als je dat gaat verstoren en je gaat dus dingen bouwen, je gaat dreggen, je gaat sleepnetvisserij doen. Ja, dan breng je die koolstof weer omhoog. Dat reageert natuurlijk uh, met zuurstof. Dan krijg je uitstoot van CO2 en dat gaat dan de atmosfeer in. En daar moet je eigenlijk voor zorgen dat je bodemrust creëert. Bodemrust is belangrijk voor biodiversiteitsherstel, maar ook voor die klimaatbuffers. Klimaatbodems eigenlijk op de, op de Noordzee moet je gaan herstellen. Two years ago, Emily and Thomas started an experiment. They want to see if life would return to the seabed by placing sandstone reef structures on the barren plains of the North Sea. And it works, even better than expected. Now they have their minds set on protecting Doggerbank, a huge sandbank between England, the Netherlands and Denmark. Thomas and I have 15 years met, met andere natuurbeschermingsorganisaties gewerkt om dit stukje in Engeland uh, vrij te waren van, van bodemsleepnetvisserij. Wat je zal zien is dat je vrij snel bepaalde soorten gaat terugzien komen en op de lange termijn wordt dat steeds rijker, steeds complexer. Als de overheid zich nou eindelijk aan haar afspraken houdt en 30% van de Noordzee, dus ook de zeebodem, die hoort daar gewoon bij, gaat beschermen, dan slaan we eigenlijk twee vliegen in één klap. Dan gaan we de natuur beschermen en herstellen en die gaat dan tegelijkertijd als klimaatbuffer voor ons werken. Wat wil je nog meer? De zee geeft eigenlijk al decennia aan, dit is te veel. En het systeem degradeert verder. Dus als je nu niet die omslag maakt, als we niet gewoon grootschalig inzetten op natuur en natuurbescherming, dan vallen die ecosystemen om. Dan kunnen ze ons niet meer dragen, kunnen ze niet meer voor ons zorgen. En ja, dat besef moet echt gaan binnenkomen bij de beslissingmakers, bij de grote sectoren. We kunnen niet blijven uh, symptoom bestrijden. Maar waar het nu dus op lijkt, is dat de overheid kiest voor... Enorm dure technofixes, afvangen van CO2. Maar de natuur laat ze links liggen. Ja, dat is een hele interessante. Het is het eeuwige dilemma, denk ik. Uh, die is gekomen met uh, enorm technologische ontwikkeling. Wat je in Nederland ziet, is dat de natuur als een soort stakeholder wordt gezien. Dat die moeilijk kan gaan doen en allerlei projecten kan bemoeilijken. En eigenlijk als een soort hindermacht uh, wordt beschouwd. Maar we moeten juist een, een omslag in dat denken hebben waarbij wij onderdeel zijn van natuur en afhankelijk van natuur. En de natuur ons moeten laten helpen om onze eigen problemen op te lossen. Het is een investering. Het is een investering in onszelf. Ah, zo cool, zo cool. Ah, Wat was dat cool, hè? Ja. Ja, zoveel jaar heb ik gewerkt. En uh, veel mooie oesters gezien. Deze dames onder water. Ik ben zo blij. Large scale intervention in natural processes is still very controversial. But actually, we've been doing just that for a very long time. The amount of greenhouse gases we release into the atmosphere on a daily basis changes the climate to such an extent that we don't know what the Earth will look like in a few decades. I mean, I think that no one should be allowed to do geoengineering. Frankly, I think we should have a global price on carbon. We should have had it back in the 90s and then we wouldn't be in this mess. Um, but we don't. And until we have meaningful international collaboration and action on holistically managing our climate, You know, we need direct action far more extreme than this. And every day we don't have that, needless species go extinct and people die. 
Basically, techno fixers and nature fixers agree with each other. Our situation is critical. But does that make every wild idea worth exploring? Or is that only delaying the fundamental changes that are needed? Yeah. People don't really want to change their way of life. We would so like to have uh, someone tell us that you don't need to, to change. We can live on as we do. <clears throat> and that, I think, is a huge mistake because people now need to understand that we need to change. But it might not be a change to, to the worse. It can be if we change and adapt in a controlled way, it can actually be a change to the, to the better.